Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so thank you, Dilendra, for the introduction. Okay, before I start, uh, so I'd like to know how many of you are using uh, Docker and Kubernetes in your organization? Just raise your hand. Okay, that's good. I'm of people now. Okay, uh, now I've seen that a lot of people are now using Docker and Kubernetes uh, in their day-to-day -day work. Okay, if you look at the, the uh, in the past, in the old days, after we build our application, we used to uh, install and configure our application top of either bare metal machine or VM machine, right? So the steps we carried out were like, uh, just we get the machine and install the open system, and then we install all the dependencies and libraries that require to our application, and then we install and configure our application on that machine, okay? Yeah? And when you come to the scale in that machine or application, we want to do follow all these three steps again and create a new machine, right? So all this, sometimes we use these manual steps to do this kind of thing. But if you want to automate, so we sometimes we use uh, Puppet, Chef, Ansible kind of orchestration language to do these uh, three steps in automation. If you come to the, uh, the modern, so we all want to deploy our application uh, as a container. This is going to be a trend now, right? So, uh, why? There's a reason behind that. Because if you deploy your application on top of uh, containers, you can get several advantages. So let's look at a few advantages uh, why people want to deploy application on as a containers. So, uh, so if in the old days, uh, like. Uh, so when you, when you want to release an uh, application, we just bundle our application artifact and as a zip file and release it. And after that, maybe off-cycle, we install it and configure it and deploy in production, right? So that is the dev cycle and the off-cycle, right? But if you look at the, the container world, the Docker container, you can bundle your application code with the, all the dependencies and libraries required to run with the configuration, right? So that now it has come to the dev cycle as well. Now, even development cycle, you can bundle your application with all dependencies and configurations all required to run that application and bundle it as a Docker image, and that can be done as a release. Right? So, uh, so in the other hand, that means uh, developer getting the exact production environment while they are doing the development. That's a, uh, that's a, there are a lot of benefit about that. Otherwise, uh, earlier days, when we, when we deployed something in production, we found up some, some bugs within that production deployment because we are, developer will not get in that environment while they are doing the de development stage. So second one is the, there's a universal packaging model, right? So uh, when you develop, uh, build a Docker image, same Docker image can be used in different stages, like uh, developer stage, test stage, and production stage, right? So that means uh, only environment-specific variables can be passed into the Docker image. Other than that, all that the universal package will go across the uh, all the pipeline. So that's another benefit. And third one is like uh, immutability. So I guess uh, most of them are, you are off person because of the DevOps track. So you, uh, if you are off person, off person you know how important of immutability, right? So when you deploying uh, your uh, application in production servers, and if it is running smoothly, you don't want to change, do any changes. Because every time when you do a changes, uh, there can be a, some problem uh, arise, right? But reality is we have to do changes. Right? We have to do patch release, patch update, we have to do the software upgrades, version upgrades. So we have to deal with this. But so earlier cases, normally what we are doing is we just chain the production servers then and there with these updates. But whenever we do in this kind of updates, if you want to roll back it to the previous version, it is very hard to do if you upgrade within the servers. But if we have a immutable servers, that means when you want to do upgrade, we can create another server with a new patch release or new versions, and when you do the testing out of that server and do the traffic routing uh, from the old server to new server. And if, if some cases, if you arise some problem in the new servers, you can just 
roll back to the previous servers. So rolling backing is very important when you're doing the uh, upgrade and patch releases in your production servers. So containers, by practice, is running as immutable. So whenever we do a patch release or patch update, we create another container image, and we deploy that image into the production. And if you want to roll back, just roll back to the previous image, previous version of that image. You are getting the running version out of uh, that uh, image, basically. So that's, okay, that's a very good practice if you want to do a rolling update in your production servers. And also, we'll, uh, we'll look at a few best practices that you can use while you are, while you are using in a Docker-based uh, uh, deployment. Uh, one best practice is you can run single process in single container. Right? You can run multiple processes in multiple uh, in single container, but if you are running a multiple process, you can't control each process within the container. But if you are running a single process in single container, you can control that process by controlling container itself. Right? That's the main benefit you can get running as a container. And other thing is the environment specific variable should be passed as the environment variable. That means, for example, if you, I say that it's a universal package. Same Docker image should be run in dev prod, dev stage prod. But if you want to pass some environment specific variables, like maybe uh, some uh, credentials, maybe some certificates, maybe some uh, data sources, it can be passed as an environment variable to that particular Docker instance will get that and configure it with itself. Other thing is, we have to reduce our content image size. Otherwise, when you want to rolling update, it will take time to pull this image and uh, make the container runtime. Uh, fourth one is, uh, if, if, you, if you can use container native programming language, you, can, you, get, you are get a lot of benefits. Uh, you can use container, non-container native programming languages as well. I will dis discuss some of the, them uh, in the later part of this uh, presentation. Yeah, so the, however, the reality is you can't run a product, production application in a single co container. So you need to run multiple processors. If you take a very simple example, maybe a Tomcat. If you want to run a Tomcat in production, right? Tomcat uh, runtime is running a single process. And if you want to do the log rotating, you need to run a cron job. That means another, another process. So that means sometimes uh, with, with the microservice architecture, now our application is going to be a set of microservices. That means set of processors. So going forward, modern application is going to be a set of processors need to be run. So in that case, that means you can't run a single container. You have to run a multiple containers. So now when you come to the running a multiple containers, now there's, there's a, other problems comes arise, right? How you can manage this thing? What is the scheduling across the uh, container cluster? How, do, how you can do the versioning and up rolling update. So all set of pro other problems will arise. Now to handle this kind of thing, we can use container management system that uh, are available in the industry. So Kubernetes is like a very mature project. It's an open source project that provide all these container management capabilities uh, and the scale, uh, provide the scalability to the container system uh, in a very uh, stable and mature way. So this is uh, started four years ago. So mainly, uh, so you know that Google is using uh, containers more than a decade, right? They are all our, uh, if you are running a Gmail uh, in your browser, there's a, a container in the Google data center running for you, right? Every person gets a container running in the Google data center. So all Google services are running as a containers. So they have the billion of containers running in their uh, data centers. So they use a system called Borg to manage these containers. Right? So then four years ago, they open sourced uh, their experience as a Kubernetes project. And all other vendors like uh, Red Hat, uh, Microsoft, uh, all, other, uh, all the, now we have hundreds of vendors supporting this Kubernetes platform as a global uh, uh, container management system. So, so, uh, so my advice is if you want to use container system in your production application, you either you have to use a container management system. So Kubernetes is a 
my recommended uh, uh, candidate to run that. Other system as available as well. There's a Docker SOM. Now even Docker community is now moving to the communities, but there's a uh, Mesosphere uh, uh, Eco system. So there are some other platform as well. So our recommendation is using Kubernetes in a uh, production system to run on the containers. So let's look at, let's start to understand uh, primitives of Kubernetes. Then it will uh, give uh, it will give some uh, the the knowledge when you're designing your application to run on a uh, Kubernetes cluster. So the number one is the Kubernetes pod. So Kubernetes pod is a smaller unit that can scale within the Kubernetes cluster. Right? When, you, when you talk about Kubernetes cluster, so Kubernetes has a, a control pane and that uh, uh, worker nodes. So Kubernetes mass is a control pane. You can pass any workload. Uh, Kubernetes was a YAML-based or JSON-based work workload. You can pass that workload to the API server. API server will do the deployment across the they are worker uh, cluster. So uh, when you come to the Kubernetes port, it is the smallest unit that can be scaled within the cluster. Right? And uh, so I said that, uh, so for example, best practice is running a single contain, processing single container. Right? But sometimes some applications want to run uh, multiple processors in tightly coupled manner. For example, sometimes we want some two independent processors need to be shared same file system. Sometimes they want to use the inter-process communication. Sometimes they have to use the same network. So these kind of scenarios, if you are running a separate containers in isolation, you can't do it. Because each container has their own file system, then their own uh, inter-process communication uh, namespaces, their own, own network. So you can't get this benefit. But in the Kubernetes spot, uh, uh, concept, it has some kind of sharing. Within the community support, you can have multiple containers run independently, but there are file system sharing, a network sharing, and interprocess communication sharing. So there are some kind of sharing. So it's a middle part, right? So basically, and also it can have isolation as well. You can have CPU isolation, you can have memory isolation. So basically, it is kind of like a, like a a balance uh, unit that you can deploy into the Kubernetes. So that's a Kubernetes port. Then Kubernetes volume. So we know that whenever we install some our application, we need to have some kind of disk storage, right? Uh, either maybe maybe have a disk attached. So in in container world, there's a volume need to attach. This this volume can be different based on the your use cases. There can be a local storage volume. Or this volume can be like a, a cloud uh, block storage, like EBS. I'm saying EBS or uh, like a Google personal storage. Or there can be like a, a cluster storage, like iSCSI or NFS. So depending on the application scenario, you can attach a different volume. So Kubernetes has a volume abstraction. Uh, so you can just, uh, you can attach any kind of volume and your application can use this volume as a disk space. OK, next uh, primitive is replication controller. So now I said that uh, the smaller units is a port. Right? Now, for example, if you take a simple example, maybe if you want to do a high availability, then you need to run at least two ports. right? So that means uh, you, went, you need to ensure running a two ports for a, make it a high available. Right? So replication control is how you can do it. A replication controller, like uh, we can say n number of ports need to be run a given particular de deployment. In this case, we have a four number of replicas. That means this replication control ensure that every time it is running four, four number of ports within new application. If it is down to three number of ports, it automatically re-spin another one to into the cluster and make it four. That is the auto healing, right? So this kind of uh, uh, auto uh, healing kind of scenario is very important when you want to manage a large number of containers in your application. Uh, Kubernetes service. So I, I talk about running uh, two ports in the for a high availability, right? Whenever if you are running more than two applications or two ports, then there's a problem how you can do the traffic routing, how you can do the load balancing among these multiple ports. 
so that we need to have a kind of load balancer to uh, cater this end, uh, requirement. So Kubernetes service is a load balancer. It's a virtual load balancer. Actually, it's a layer for load balancing. It will do the IP layer load balancing using IP tables rules. Uh, so, and so uh, you can attach group of ports for a particular Kubernetes service. So when you create a port, port will get a separate IP address. Right? So ports are not to run a long run. It, it can be uh, destroyed and create a new port. Right? Then that means IP can be changed for regularly. Right? Now if you tightly couple your other application to call this particular port using IP address, then there's an issue. Right? Then what we can do is when we create a community service, community service get another virtual IP. And this service IP doesn't change. And so you can access this set of group of port using the Kubernetes service IP, and the Kubernetes service will do the load balancing. And other beautiful thing is you can attach uh, DNS domain names right to the Kubernetes service. Then if you if you configure say if you create a service called foo with the set of ports, you can access this service using foo as a DNS name. Right? Then it will uh, give a lot of benefits while doing while we are using, uh, working on the microservice development. And so, other thing is Kubernetes service has different type of service types. And sometimes uh, some services only need to be talk with the other service within the cluster. That is lo local communication. If you want to do local communication load balancing, you can use the cluster IP based Kubernetes service. And sometimes we want to expose this local service to the ex external world. If you want to do that, we can use either Kubernetes node port. Node port means you, it will generate a random port number to a particular service and attach to the one of the Kubernetes node, and you can access IP and the port using external service. And if you deploy your Kubernetes cluster to a cloud provider, like a EKS, a GKS, or AKS, like, uh, different cloud providers, you can integrate they are cloud providers load balancer into the Kubernetes cluster. In that scenario, you can use there's a service type called load balancer type. If you use that load balancer type service uh, uh, constructor, then it will open a load balancer port in the cloud provider to route the traffic into the, in the internal cluster. Depending on use case, you can use multiple Kubernetes uh, service type in your applications. Uh, Next one is Kubernetes secret. So, so you know when you want to deploy in production, so we need to handle the credentials, right? There can be a password, there can be a certificate, we need to handle. What we are doing in normal day-to-day, -day, we just copy that password or even the certificate into the local file system and configure our application. Right? Now, when you come to the uh, Docker world, so normally we have to burn all things into the Docker image, right? That's the way of doing that in the Docker world. Now, if you burn your certificates into the Docker world or credentials in the Docker, Docker image, every time if you want to change that certificate or the uh, uh, secrets, you want to recreate the image. That is number one problem. So you, you, you have to, every time you have to recreate the image. Second one is, since if you burn that credentials into the Docker image, every, anyone access that Docker image, expose these credentials. That's not a good practice. Right? So when you come to the Kubernetes world, you can use Kubernetes secret. That's a kind called Kubernetes, Kubernetes secret. You can create this uh, object called Kubernetes, Kubernetes secret, and you can attach uh, like a credentials or certificate to that secret. Then when you create a port, you can lately bind this secret into that port. When you bind that port, it, either it can be mounted as a volume, or it can be used as an environment variable. Within your application, you can just see it as an environment variable. The other the beauty part, part of it is this volume is only in the memory. It is never touched to this disk. So it will, whenever you destroy the container, there's no credentials in the disk. It is, when you kill the container, it is already gone. That's a, it carefully handles the secret within the Kubernetes uh, deployment. Another concept is Kubernetes namespace. So if you are a large organization, you need to have some, some kind of tenancy. Right? You need to control different department, maybe. So in that kind of scenario, you can use Kubernetes namespace. 
you can create the namespace and you can attach different resources. You can say, okay, I need, I need, uh, I, I, I can create a namespace called A. I can say only 10 ports can be uh, deployed within the namespace A. Only uh, five secret can be created within the namespace A. You can have resource management by using Kubernetes and namespace. Okay, when you come to the config map. So if you know about 12 factor uh, apps, right? Uh, with the uh, with the microservice and the uh, 12 factor scenarios so we have to pass our variables as n1 variable that's the way of doing in the future application so when you come to that so uh, so kubernetes uh, has a concept called config map like kubernetes secret you can create a config map uh, uh, object you can attach all the configuration that config map then you can lately bind to the kubernetes port in this config map, then this config map variable will be available into the your port as a known variable. Right? So that's uh, again the best practice you can use in the Kubernetes uh, deployment. Kubernetes ingress. So I talk about the Kubernetes services. I, I said that there's a lay layer for load balancing. Right? So now in, in Kubernetes ingress, you can do layer seven uh, uh, routing basically. Basically, if you want to have some kind of like HTTP, HTTPS uh, based uh, routing, maybe he header based routing or maybe a URL path based routing, you can use Kubernetes ingress controller to map all these uh, different path or different domain names uh, uh, in the routing path, then it will route it to the your internal uh, cluster. Then the daemon set. So normally, when you, when you create a workload in Kubernetes, when you pass that into the API server, API server will do the scheduling based on the availability of the Kubernetes uh, uh, nodes, uh, resource availability in the Kubernetes node. It will schedule your, uh, your ports in different nodes. Right? That's the normal behavior in Kubernetes. But sometimes you want to deploy your application in every node in the Kubernetes cluster. Maybe some use case. Maybe if you want to do some agent running on every uh, node, maybe some kind of monitoring or some kind of local aggregating kind of agents you want to run in every node. Then you can use Kubernetes daemon set uh, type of uh, kind. Then it will make sure when you deploy this kind of daemon set application, it will install, it will deploy all these applications across all the nodes in the Kubernetes. Right? So it has a, that capability. So uh, one other concept is like a uh, Kubernetes, uh, uh, the graceful termination. Normally, so when you either scale down or when you want to stop some, or when you want to kill some uh, application in Kubernetes cluster, when you, uh, when you hit that command or in the scale gun is triggered, it will send a sick term signal into the application. If you run, if you write your application to listen that uh, uh, signal, sick term signal, you can shut down your application within the uh, your, uh, uh, container itself. If not, Kubernetes will wait for 30 seconds for default termination time. It will do the forceful termination. Okay, so I talk about the, the replication controller. So replication controller, you can control the replicas count, right? So that's a manual, in, manual way of rep, uh, controlling the replicas count. If you want to run uh, 10 replicas, you can say, I want to run uh, 10, 10 replicas in the replication control. Now, Kubernetes horizontal port autoscaler, we call it HPA. So you can do automatically, uh, like scaling up and down. We can say min and max in the rep, uh, HPA. Say, I want to have a min, uh, two ports running on my application. I have a 10 of, so for that max for the, particular application. Then, in minimum case, it will run into container, Kubernetes port. Now, based on, we can, you can, you can uh, set the threshold value in the HPA saying that, uh, at the moment, it is only working with CPU uh, utilization. You can say, more than 50% uh, of CPU uh, gaining, uh, running on your particular cluster, you should create new number of ports. Then, if you set this kind of rules as a Kubernetes HPA, it automatically detect this one, automatically scale up to the maximum number of uh, you set in the UHPA configuration. So it is automatically scaled up and down based on your, your policy defined 
in the HPA. Okay, so uh, so I will do few demo, uh, two demos actually. Uh, so I talk about different uh, primitives, right? So when you're dealing with Kubernetes, the pay payload is going to be a YAML file. So you have to create YAML files as a your payload and pass into the Kubernetes API server, either using Kubernetes, uh, kubectl is a command line uh, in, uh, tool. So I will, uh, OK. Anyone, anyone can read this screen, right? Good, OK. So here, I just I have a, a simple uh, YAML file. So, so this is a, two different kinds. One is a deployment kind, and then one is uh, the service kind. Deployment kind means how you can deploy, or you can create your number of ports in your Kubernetes cluster. So here, you can see, uh, so I am just uh, setting a, a name, uh, okay, bottom one is a deployment kind. I'm getting the name, and here I use the Docker image name uh, as my application payload. So this is my application. This is just a simple hello world, right? And when I when I use this uh, uh, descriptor uh, YAML file, when I deploy it, it will create a deployment. And in the top, I have set the Kubernetes service. I I, I talk about Kubernetes service right? how to access my application, and I need to access via Kubernetes service, Kubernetes service load balancer. So in this case, I'm just open a node port type. That means I can access my service using IP address and the port. So I will go into just deploy this one. I'm using kubectl. I'm running Kubernetes in my Mac machine. Uh, kubectl, uh, maybe apply minus f. Uh, so when I, when I deploy it, it will create a uh, Kubernetes service and the deployment. So if I use the Kubs CTL get ports, you can see one out of one is running in the Kubernetes port. To access, I have to get the node port to access my cluster. I can get so here is attached to the uh, uh, three one one nine nine. If I use a curl command. So it will uh, route my uh, payload, uh, my request to the payload uh, uh, port, and uh, retrieve the uh, uh, basic response. So if I want to like uh, uh, manually auto uh, scale up this cluster, I just uh, I will change my replica count to three, right? And I just apply my changes. All right. Now if I if I do the now it is running three number of ports within my application. Same, uh, I can use same curl command. It will do the load balancing and do the routing within the three number of ports. That's very simple. But like, you want to create a Kubernetes secret, you want to create a Kubernetes, uh, uh, like a config map, every time you have to create this YAML payload and pass into the Kubernetes API server. So uh, let me delete this one. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, it's my switch. Uh, okay. Now, so so if you are a ops person, you may have if you if you want to create this kind of YAML, you have to deal with different tools, tooling, right? Either you have to keep the template and edit the template, and you have to change deploy the uh, user deployment, right? So writing a YAML file in hand. Basically, how many of you try that? Okay, how many? First time, how many of you uh, able to run that without any error, any indentation error? No, right? Because it's very hard to manage. Basically, if you if you use a tool, yes, you can do it. But handwriting numbers are very hard to do. So, uh, to overcome that, different uh, tools in the in the industry. 
So I am I am not going all of these. So different different uh, vendors coming with different approaches. Sometimes uh, they use external tools to generate these samples. So uh, so I I will share my slide deck. You can go through this one. So the meta particle and the ballerina taking different aspect how to create this kind of YAMLs. So all other tools are using in the ops, ops cycles to generate these YAMLs, right? But in the meta particle and are trying to overcome that or, or trying to come up with different solution with the development developer cycle as well. So I will just a quick demo, and I will wrap it my uh, 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 this thing. Uh, Okay, uh, so here, this is my simple Ballina file, hello world. So basically, within the uh, uh, Ballina file, I have defined uh, two annotations here. So, uh, uh, so I define the uh, Kubernetes deployment annotation and Kubernetes service annotation. And so I don't have any knowledge of YAML files or uh, YAML descriptors. I just, it's, it is support the ID based support generated this uh, uh, annotation. So I just, uh, uh, so here I just have only the same bile file. So I, if I use the ballerina build command, okay. So it will generate all the Kubernetes artifact out of my code. You can see it will generate uh, deployment YAML and service YAML. So you can use uh, kubectl command or helm command. Uh, so for example, it just, just just type here and this. So it will deploy my application in the Kubernetes without creating any YAML files. Uh, you have you can uh, use it. So so if you interested like uh, uh, how Ballina can uh, how to create a microservices and how to make it resiliency, how to make it uh, a transaction availability, uh, how to make it deployment uh, with different cloud providers or different. Uh, uh, Orchestration okay, clusters. Uh, we having a to, tomorrow. We having a full day uh, track in Ballina track. So uh, I uh, welcome all, invite all to come to that track if you want to more uh, demos or more learning experience you can get uh, within the track. This is about it. My presentation. Uh, maybe a quick one or two questions. No. Okay. I'm available. So I'm available in the uh, uh, area. So you can ask any question after we can meet him. Thank you very much.